Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz saxophonist John Butcher. We Zoomed with him on July 30th, 2020 during the surreal COVID-19 world about his life and music. His work ranges through improvisation, his own compositions, multi-track pieces, and explorations with feedback, unusual acoustics, and non-concert locations. Originally a physicist, he left academia in 1982 and has since collaborated with hundreds of musicians. He is well known as a solo performer who attempts to engage with the uniqueness of place. Get to know him and dig this interview. Well, hey, John, thanks for taking a minute out to talk to me during this very strange time on the planet. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. I'm happy to do it. I, I, I've got to say, I, I do have the, uh, the free time. Of it. <laughs> I think we all do now. So before we get into your latest CD, what I'd like to know from you, since kind of a part of this interview, the functionality of it is going to be talking about this strange new world. When in early to mid-March did you realize we were entering this pandemic mode and jazz was shutting down how did all of that how did your itinerary get affected how did everything kind of unfold for you well around right about the 12th of march i was in berlin to do some mastering for some lps that are coming out and uh i knew things were changing then when i got there and i stayed in the hotel i usually stay in which is like a 200 room hotel and two of the rooms are occupied and uh just during the course of the weekend, all the clubs shut, restaurants were shutting, and then the schools shut over there. Um, and then I came back, rather nervously did what was turned out to be my last gig, I hope not ever, but certainly the last gig this year, at Cafe Otto. And um, then about a week later, the UK went into shutdown. And it was kind of almost overnight that you know, all the future work just just fell off the map. What what have you been doing since everything shut down? How have you dealt with the the reality that you know there's no live music and things have to continue to move on? Well, there's no great solution to that. I mean, quite a few people are putting on sort of online, you know, performances from their homes and things. That, you know, solo performances or sometimes collaborating with the Zoom. But none of that really appeals to me because um, you know the music I'm interested in is very much about um, you know improvising in a you know one off occasion in front of a live audience, and it seems just it just doesn't feel right to be you know doing it to just to a microphone. Talk to me about your latest album. It came out in 2019, 40 foot square room live. I, it, it has to be nostalgic to have a live album out during this time where we have no live music. Yeah, it's, it's called... Um, hang on, just let me, let me get my wires right as well. Do you edit these shows at all? Probably? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 I do, I do. I will make sure to edit this, yeah. You're talking about um, a record called At the Hill of James McGee, which I did with Joe McPhee. Okay, yeah. And um, that record came out um, last year. And the it's a live recording, but it, it was actually recorded ten years ago at um, this incredible uh, construction that uh, the artist James McGee has spent thirty years building uh, in the desert outside of El, El Paso. And Joe McPhee and I were invited by him through. Dave Dove, who runs an organization out of Houston called um, Nameless Sam, to do a special performance there. It only ever once had any uh, performance, any live music there, and was large, this place was largely unknown to the public. So it was, it was um, advertised and people really traveled to hear it. And it was an extraordinary experience, really, playing amongst these giant... Um, stone buildings that he he built to house his sculptures right in the middle of nowhere. Let's go back to the beginnings of your life. Talk to me a little bit about how jazz became your life, you know, where you were born and raised and kind of, kind of how everything began for you. In, this, in a way, I think I'm on your show, on your podcast by Paul's Pretenses, because I'm not, I don't consider myself a jazz musician. Although, um, if you play the saxophone, people find that Hard to, um, people people aren't that, that, that keen on keen on that. So 
Brilliant. Uh, you know, I played a, a number of different instruments as, as, a, child, as a school kid. And I got, got into saxophone when I went to university, which was actually to study physics. And in the course of playing with a lot of different people, one of the things I was also playing was was a kind of jazz. And at that time in the UK, this is the 70s, there was a great flowering of British jazz with people like John Sermon, Tony Oxley, Mike Westbrook, the various South Africans like Louis Maholo and Chris McGregor who'd come over and were effectively exiled uh, in the UK. And I was going to hear their gigs in London and getting inspired by them. So, for a while, that was, uh, you know, what I was really interested in pursuing. And then after a while, it became clear to me that it, it, you know, it wasn't really the music of my generation or the music of my um, culture. So, I, if you'd like, I took the improvisatory spirit of jazz and tried to step out into some other directions with it. And a lot of those directions, some path had already been set by the various free improvisers of the 60s and 70s, who I was also hearing at that time. What do you like the best about being a musician? Okay, I think what I like best is that it's a communal art. It's something you do in collaboration with other people. So, I'm, you'll, you'll find from I just, all the musicians you talk to, there's a lot of... Musicians have strong opinions about stuff. So it's always a bit of a paradox that most musicians actually like to collaborate. I'm not talking about people like, you know, people writing pen-on-paper compositions in their comfortable uh, homes and going out and giving instructions to other people. I'm talking about people who genuinely want to try and make collaborative music. And um, that's what sustains me. I, I would say there's probably about, at any one time, there's probably about 50 people around the world I really enjoy playing with. And in the course of a couple of years, I'll play with most of them in different combinations. And much like any um, sets of relationships, you know, people leave that group, people, new people enter that group. I can play with, like if I play with Joe McPhee, who's, um, this year he was 80, you know, with a very different background and history than myself, or I can play with, you know, people in their 20s who know nothing about jazz and have come from electronic music, say. You have this possibility of such a wide range of collaboration that it's, it's continually replenishing your, your imagination. So when we do come back to live music, when the coronavirus calms down and people get live music back in their lives, what do you hope both musician and the audience realizes from this time away from the live music? Well, I don't, first of all, I think it's very optimistic to think it's going to come back in any way like uh, it has been. Um, I mean, I've, I've had everything cancelled currently through to about March next year. And um, the reality of being a musician, the economic reality of being a musician, means a lot of travel. And the whole travel situation is going to be drastically changed. I mean, I was going on planes and flying to Europe a couple of times a week to do it come back, do another one, come back. In America, people are flying around all the time up to do shows in different places. Um, I think that ease is going to vanish. So um, I'm not particularly optimistic about the future for live music. Are you? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I am actually. Um, I can tell you here in Kansas City, I've seen a couple live shows in the last couple weeks, and they're drive-ins, and there's it's a lower capacity. But we have to find a way to make this work. And what I've experienced with jazz musicians is that they are a pretty tenacious group of people that will find a way to survive one way or another. 
Yeah, the old world from March 12th is gone. It'll never be back. We're never going to get back to that reality again. But I do think that there's going to be enough hunger and enough thirst, and there's going to be ways that we can make this work. Um, and the only way that I think mentally we're going to be healthy about making this work is knowing that we're not going to be able to do it the way we did it before. But it will have to happen because everybody wants it that bad. Well, there's always people who want to play. And there's yeah. always the need to play. Um, you know, it's, it's like my feeling about a lot of the online shows that are happening, which aren't really, you know, they aren't shows because they're people, people playing from their bedrooms half the time, is that this, it shows, it, for me it shows the vital importance of performing in front of other people, sharing music by, sharing the moment of creation with an audience. And if you can't do that, the actual music itself is going to deteriorate in a very negative way. I think it becomes it becomes more and more of a more it's it's a solipsism, you know, just to be performing to your five friends on the internet. Yeah. And um, one of the the things that was cancelled later in the year for me was because you know in Germany at the moment said you would have at least 13 metres between the audience and any wind players. And it was a smallish club in southern Germany I was meant to be playing. So to have, you, to have that between the audience and, and the musicians and to have the distancing between people inside that, that would put about a main, an audience of about six. And we're dealing with a situation where uh, it's always been a struggle to... Uh, you know, make a decent income from, from playing live gigs. And cutting the audience to 10%, which is what the moment, is, is completely unsustainable. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think we're going to experience that in a lot of different realms. Um, there, there's going to be that reality. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. It will be very interesting how this unfolds and where it unfolds and um, all of that. Um, so let me ask you this. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're the one that's living your life. Who do you think you are? <laughs> you don't ask a very easy question. Yeah, so, sometimes they're difficult. <laughs> Can, okay, that's, it's too broad to ask who somebody is. I'm not really prepared to dig into these things in a serious manner. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not trying to do that in a serious manner. It's usually just kind of my final question to just have an idea of who you think you, you know, might be. Um, just, it kind of gets to the essence sometimes. But yeah, we, we can skip it. That's fine. Um, that's pretty much where I'm at. That's kind of, th those were kind of my questions that I wanted to ask you to kind of get a better idea to present you to my audience. So thank you for taking a minute out today. I appreciate it. That's okay. I mean, it's certainly topical. It, it, was, it was very little about music and more about our situation. But, uh, I think that's where we're at right now with the world. I think there's, there's levels of this. I'm kind of trying to talk a little bit more about what's going on. And I think in between the lines of it being a modern expose on the world, you, we, we do actually delve into the music and get into it and um, kind of have a better idea of why you're creating and wh what you're creating and, and, you know, just those kinds of things. But, I mean, if there's anything specifically you wanted to kind of open up about about your music, I'm more than happy to, you know, go down that route if you want. Yeah, no, we can leave it at that. That's fine. Cool. Hey, thanks again, man. I really appreciate you taking some time out okay. today. Yep, you're welcome. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in the UK, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to John for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time. Enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.